Good morning and happy Sabbath. Uh, we're thankful again that uh, the Lord had blessed us with a, another Sabbath day that we can worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And um, we're thankful that the Lord has again gifted us this time. And as we looked, as we were on the Sabbath day, um, we would like to offer a word of prayer for each one that is here and also for those who will be watching online and those who will be joining us in this uh, important lesson study for this morning. So um, let us have a word of prayer, and then we will begin our study for this morning. Let us pray. <clears throat> oh, most kind, beloved Heavenly Father, we are thankful again that you have allowed us to come together to fellowship as a church, as believers in the end of time, and as those who are part of the um, second Advent movement and who are um, keeping the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So Lord, we ask you, Lord, to be with us as a church body, be with all who are online and also with our church um, throughout the world uh, as we seek to um, study the scriptures and study to see what you have given us uh, to also a light to the greater light, um, to advance uh, God's people, the remnant at the end of time. So bless us now with your Holy Spirit. Um, open each person's minds and heart to what will be shared this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, we'd like to welcome one, every, everyone out to the Three Angels Fellowship and... Um, our Sabbath school um, lesson today is, is a very interesting one, and um, uh, we're looking at prophetic guidance, um, how God's people are being led, and, um, and um, how God works in the ways that God works through his prophets and through, and through his word. And so as we consider that, our lesson for this morning, again, is titled Biblical Platform of the Prophetic Gift. Well, as we consider that, uh, we do have a guiding text and that is coming from the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. And it reads... Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And this is, um, as we consider this quote, let's consider this throughout this study this morning. And as we compare um, the word of God with the spirit of prophecy, you know, we'll have to see how it all ties in. Um, and did God speak? How did he speak through his prophets of old? And, and so as we look at this lesson, let's consider as we go through the, this lesson study this morning. Now, um, for those who have the lesson study, um, uh, we're looking at the first page. And as we look at this study, well, let's look at that first, uh, the second paragraph, um, and then we will look to a scripture text to, to tie in with that. Now, it, it reads, um, surely, well let's, well, let's go, I'll, in fact, what I'll do is, let's go to Amos chapter 3, verse 7. For those who are here in the sanctuary, let's turn to Amos 3, verse 7. And then if, if someone would like to read that text, um, we're talking about how God communicates, communi how God's communication of the truth. How does he communicate the truth? Well, again, that's Amos 3, verse 7. So we'll get a reader for Amos 3, 7, and this is one of the ways that God communicates the truth Amos. to his people. Amos chapter 3 and verse 7, the Bible says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. 
Amen, amen, amen. And, um, and even as we consider that, um, let's turn to the book of Second Chronicles 20, 20. Second Chronicles 20, 20, and I'd like someone to read that scripture because uh, what does God say? Uh, should we believe the prophets? Should we believe the word of God? Is there, uh, you know, as we consider that, what does God say about whether we should believe the word of God and should we believe his prophets? Well, Second Chronicles 20, 20, I guess a reader to read that text because that's a very important text for those who are studying the scriptures and also who are looking to study um, the spiritual writings, spiritual gifts that are written. Uh, let's go to Second Chronicles again, 2020. Second Chronicles 2020. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. Amen. That's a very, very important statement, and that's a very good counsel from the word of God. You know, uh, God wants us to believe in the Bible and also in his prophets. And so... Let's consider, let's consider that, and there's a, right below on that first, um, that first, uh, I should say the second paragraph, it says, through the ages, prophets have been the principal means employed by God um, in bringing light to his people, and the gift of prophecy wrote by, wrote A.G. Daniels, ranks next to the supreme gift of his only begotten Son and his Holy Spirit to a world estranged and separated by sin. And that's coming from the abiding gift of prophecy, page 15. Again, so we see that um, there's much uh, that we need to consider. Um, the next um, yes, yeah, but... yeah I, I actually wanted to um, kind of add on to what you've been saying as far as uh, God in Amos chapter 3 and verse uh, 7, God mentioning that he would not do anything unless he would first reveal it to the prophets. And then John chapter 15 in verse, beginning in verse 14, the Bible says, this is Jesus speaking, ye are my friends if, Jesus gives a condition, ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. So even though it says that surely, surely the Lord will do nothing except he reveal it to his servants, the prophets, Jesus is uh, making a distinction, basically. He's saying uh, his servants, the prophets, are actually his friends. Um, and you can also look in, you can look at Abraham's case. Uh, mm -hmm. just before Sodom was to be uh, condemned and destroyed, mm -hmm. Jesus said, should I not let Abraham know what is to be done, right? But it also, the Bible also uh, proclaims Abraham to be God's friend, right? And so I think um, for us, we need to absolutely uh, remember that God's friends are the ones that he reveals his secrets to. Uh, and because of they are his friends, he has sent his friends to make more friends and reveal his secrets unto them. So it's, it's a big circle of uh, love, basically. If, if I can just uh, jump in and add to what Brother White was saying, not only was Abraham a friend um, and a servant, um, but he was also a prophet as well. Mm -hmm. And so let me just share that text 
in Genesis chapter 20. Genesis 20. And verse 7, and this, this is actually about Abimelech who was reproved for taking Sarah's, uh, Sarah Abraham's wife, right? Of course, Abraham wasn't truthful about the relationship, but, you know, God began to, um, to correct um, him. Um, he came to him in a dream and told him that he was a dead man because... The, this, this woman that you have in your house is another man's wife. Of course, mm -hmm. again, Abraham has some, some responsibility in that. But notice verse 7. Verse 7 says now, this is Genesis 20, verse 7. Now, therefore, restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, mm -hmm. and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, I know, uh, know thou that uh, thou shalt surely die, thou and all thine that are thine. So hmm. Abraham also was many things in the Bible, but he also had the gift of prophecy as well. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Um, that an another statement there that lets us know that Abraham is also God spoke through him and also gave him the, the gift to prophesy. Okay. Um, in the book Education, it reads, in, in the highest, in, in the highest um, sense, the prophet was one who spoke by direct inspiration, um, communicating to the people the message he had received from God. And that's in the book Education, page 40. Now, as we consider their writings again, let's turn to the book of Luke. In fact, let's go to the book of Acts. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 3, verse 21. I'd like a reader to read Acts 3, verse 21. Acts 3, verse 21. It says, Whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Amen. If I, if I may, uh, just to piggyback on that text, just to kind of get a, um, a, um, a understanding as far as the prophets, what they were called before prophets, if we can go to 1 Samuel 9, 9, 1 Samuel 9, 9, just if we see these, this phrase, uh, we're not confused by it. If we can go to 1 Samuel 9, 9, and it says, Before time in Israel, when a man went to acquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer, for he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. So. We just yes. see how, uh, if we see that phrase in the Bible, seer, that we know it was a prophet mm -hmm. before it was called a prophet. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you for that um, comment. And as we continue to go through this uh, lesson study this morning, um, at the fall of Adam, face, you know, at, at the fall of Adam, face to face communication between heaven and earth was cut off. Thereafter, from time to time, the Lord chose godly persons to serve as the prophets or spokesmen. There were times also when angels appeared to men, or God spoke by an audible voice from heaven. Adam, Enoch, Abraham, Isaac, Job, Jacob, Joseph, and others of the patriarchal age received communication from God and passed this message up onto their children. You know, as we consider that thought, um, we also have to consider the other prophets that also receive visions and dreams. Uh, consider Ezekiel, consider 
Daniel, John on the Alamo of Patmos. So we see that God, again, that this prophetic gift is very important, uh, especially to his end church at the end of time, that this is something that we must consider and see how important it is that plays in our day and even uh, the things that are given again are for God's remnant church that they may be able to stand and to also give an account of what they have received through the word of God and also through the writings of the prophets. So as we continue going through this um, lesson um, yes you have a comment? Okay go right ahead. just wanted to give an example of that because the lesson talked about um, the different ages. First it was the patriarchs. Mm -hmm. um, in Genesis chapter 49, in verse number one, it says, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together mm -hmm. that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. So we see an example of a prophet who did not write a book in the Bible, right? Who has the gift of prophecy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting and you could read the entire chapter and it talks about um, each and every one of his sons and what they would be like, not only them, but their descendants. But, you know, it, it's interesting. It, it says, in the last days. Amen, amen. Thank you for that. Uh -huh. Well, let's continue. Um, this is uh, very interesting as we read. Um, and as we consider uh, the prophets and also prophecy, um, let's consider um, after the writing of the scriptures, um, how did God, again, um, did God say something special to his people in, in, through his prophets? that also would be, uh, I would say, considered to go forward in how God would speak to his people. Again, as we consider that, um, let's go to the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 28. Joel 2, verse 28. As we consider, what did, what did God say to, through the prophet Joel concerning these uh, last days? Well, as we consider that, well, let's um, again go to Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And we actually could, I, I think we could go all the way through to 31. Yeah. So if we have a reader for Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, verse yeah. 28 through 31. Yes. Okay, the Bible says in Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Amen. Amen. Um, as we consider the words that were spoken, in, um, let's, we want to hone in on what was said in Joel 2.28. Um, God is saying that, you know, he's going to part his spirit upon all flesh. Your sons, your daughters shall um, prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, young men shall have visions. And um, so this is very, very important as we consider uh, the end of time. And so um, visions is another way that God is speaking through his people. And um, many of us, if you have read the book of Daniel, you see many visions when you consider uh, the, the, the vision that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar. And after he gave that vision to Nebuchadnezzar, 
uh, that he didn't remember that, the, that particular vision, but then God had to use Daniel and, and, um, to, again, um, he gave it back to Daniel, that vision. And so it's very important how visions, how God uses visions. And even God, Daniel, God gave Daniel the power to also interpret visions. And so we see um, this is very important for us who are living at the, at the end of time, to believe, to believe that uh, God would use visions, he used dreams, he used similitudes, and he used the words of the prophets. Um, you see from, and another important point is that I would say is that as you consider the prophets, the prophets uh, from, um, from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, the prophets agree. They agree. And, and so as, you, as we go through the Bible, we'll see that how important it is uh, that we consider what the prophets have spoken and that uh, what they have written and what God gave them was in this inspired word. It wasn't their word, but they received it by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And so we see how important it is um, that we look at it uh, to see how God speaks to his people through the prophets, through dreams and visions. And so let's continue. Um, yes, you have a comment? Sure. Um, I have a comment on the time frame in which Joel was speaking about. Okay. The sun is turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. We know those signs. We've studied those signs. Um, with the second coming of, of Christ, we know those signs. We know that that happened fairly recently. But in that day, what's going to happen? Oh, you're, you know, there's going to be people that have the gift of prophecy. And that's, this is just another text that shows you that the gift of prophecy is not a dead gift. You know, some individuals don't believe that there can be prophets today. Amen. Uh, you know, um, in today's day, even with the coming eclipse, um, a lot of people... Uh, are proclaiming to have the gift of prophecy. Hmm. You know, a lot of them are saying this eclipse will be the day. This eclipse will be when Jesus returns. And this, this eclipse is so prophetic. It's this and it's that. And um, from what we just read uh, in Joel chapter 2 in verse um, 28, mm -hmm. it says that, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Uh, but it also mentions here, um, actually, I think I want to go to, oh, I was looking in Isaiah, actually, sorry, Isaiah chapter 44. In verse 3, it says, For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, mm -hmm. and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessings upon thy offspring. So this is a certain class that's receiving this, this water, this blessing. Mm -hmm. But in that verse, God says, I will pour it out upon those who are thirsty. A lot of us are not thirsty for the water that Jesus was looking to provide, even unto the Samaritan woman. Mm -hmm. And she was willing to partake of that, that water. And mm -hmm. so a lot of people in, in today's day are not thirsty. They're just they're proclaiming that they have the gift of prophecy, but God says you're not thirsty. So how can you receive the gift of prophecy, which I will pour out in those days? So when they proclaim that the solar eclipse is going to be this and is going to be that, and they're parched and they're mm -hmm. not thirsty, we can pretty much uh, disregard everything that they're talking about. Okay. Amen. Well, thank you for that. Um, as we continue in this, the lesson study this morning, um, I'm, doing, I'm, in, I'm on the second page of our, our study. 
under the, after the writing of the Holy Scriptures. And there is a, also a relationship between the church's obedience to God's law and the, manis, and the manifestation in it of the spirit of prophecy. Well, let's we'll have a couple of scripture texts we want to look at. Again, Revelation 12, 17. And can I have another reader for Revelation 19, verse 10? Well, let's go first to what is written in Revelation 12, verse 17. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then we also said Revelation 19, yes. 10. Yes, what is, the, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Amen. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Can I also add another text with that as well? I yes. think it's like a threefold chord when you're dealing with this, because it says, the angel Gabriel said, I am of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Now we know the testimony of Jesus is spirit of prophecy, but who are the brethren Amen. that have it, right? That's, that's, that's also a key understanding as well. And so uh, to find out who the brethren are, uh, Revelation 22, because when you say brethren, does that mean that I have the gift, mm -hmm. that you know, this sister has the gift, that this brother mm -hmm. has a gift? Do we all have the gift? Mm -hmm. um, who are the brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, mm -hmm. which is the spirit of prophecy? Uh, Revelation 22, verse uh, 8 and 9. And I, and I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book worship God. So Amen. who are the brethren? Mm -hmm. The prophets. The so prophets. understand that the testimony of Jesus is with the brethren, the prophets. We're talking about the prophets, right? So not Amen. everybody is called to be a prophet. We may be called to study the prophecies and mm -hmm. to teach the prophecies, Amen. but it's the brethren that have this gift. And obviously we know that we believe that Sister White fulfills that in the sense of being amongst the, the brethren, meaning the gift would be in or, or in the midst of the church, church, but the brethren are the prophets that have the testimony of Jesus, Amen. which is the spirit of prophecy. Amen. Amen. If I can make one quick comment, uh, just to piggyback on something you said, Elder, um, when you talked about how, uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians 14, 32, and this is a very important text because we have to make sure that we understand and recognize that all of the prophets have to agree. Mm -hmm. They might speak in some of these things in a different way but the foundation is the same. Mm -hmm. And the text reads in 1 Corinthians 14, 32, it says, and the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So mm -hmm. Daniel has to agree with Isaiah. Isaiah has to agree with John. Mm -hmm. They can't speak mm -hmm. of a private interpretation. And that leads me to another, another text. Let's go to first, second Peter one, if we can. Unless you were going to go there, brother. If, you were going to, if you're not going to go there, I'll, I'll let you. No, no. Go, it's go okay. Ahead, okay, okay. Let's go to 2 Timothy, Second Peter, Second Peter uh, 1, and we'll look at verses 19 uh, to 21. It says, We also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place unto the day dawn. And the day star arise in your heart, knowing this first, that no prophecy is of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Amen. So when we look at 
1 Corinthians 14, 32, there has to be an agreement amongst all the pro prophets. Mm -hmm. They can't have their own private interpretation. And you know, verse, verse 21 says, for the prophecy came not in old times by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. So it's very important that we understand that all the prophets are going to agree. And everything that Sister White does is in agreement with all the prophets in the Bible. Amen. Amen. Thank you for bringing those two texts. Those are two very important texts. Um, again, these are witnesses that, um, again, as I had said, that, the, that um, again, it's, it, two or three witnesses let us know that this has um, actually, upon two or three witnesses, we know that this is true. So um, we're thankful for those particular th texts that were just brought out. And um, as we consider, as we con continue through the study, um, let's consider um, of the foundation for the faith of the gift of prophecy, in the gift of prophecy. Well, a couple of scriptures we want to look at, and um, one of them is Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, and the second one is 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. So I get a reader for Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 13. Ephesians chapter 4, yes. 11 through 13. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Amen. Amen. And um, again, this is um, very, this, uh, these texts here that we are touching on, it's again showing us that how important it is um, that there's going to be apostles, there will be pastors, um, and there will be prophets, there will be evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And so, again, we see that this work, again, this work is important because it's bringing forth the, that is it's for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so, um, and then it also says, when this, when this work is being done through the prophets, through the apostles, through the evangelists, and through the pastors and teachers, that it does something special. It says it will bring, it says the work of this uh, ministry and of the edifying of the body of Christ is that till we all come, in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So there's a special work that's going on through these, through these ministries. And so well, let's consider that, how important it is. The, the prophets, how important are the, the pastors, the ministers, and also the, the, the work of the evangelists and the, and the teachers, all who are partaking a part in this work, again, how important it is for us at the end of time. Um, uh, I just wanted to reiterate what you just said. Um, there is multiple people that God has, uh, re is relying upon. Uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, but I've... Uh, grown to, to see um, that in verse 12, it mentions a threefold work. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the perfecting of the saints, there's mm -hmm. the work of the ministry, and the edifying of the body of Christ. And I've learned to look for this threefold work. Of course, mm -hmm. we can, you know, uh, apply certain things to the three angels' messages, and I've, I've grown to learn to look for this threefold work 
because of uh, Pastor Taylor. He's always finding the threefold work. And so mm-hmm. now I'm, I'm beginning to see <laughs> as I study Amen. that God is, he's, he's a God of order. And he's, he's repetitive, not in the sense that, you know, that, okay, he's saying it again, but for us to get it and for us to be established. Mm-hmm. So this is a threefold work that God has given to many people. And if that threefold work is not being accomplished within the church, mm-hmm. then there is no unity of the faith. God Amen. wants us to perfect the saints, right? Perfecting of the saints, mm-hmm. do the work of ministry and edify in the body of Christ so that we can come into the unity of Christ. Amen. So if we're not doing it, and there's many different times where we come here and uh, it's preached on us getting to work and no work is being done, you know, and, and not just us, but a bunch of churches. No work is being done we, how are we preaching about becoming unified when the work is not being done? It's a threefold work, right? The three yeah, angels' yeah. messages uh, are given so that we can be edified, so that we can do ministry, right? Uh, yeah. So I think we need to be more focused on those three verses that you just gave for us to read. Because um, yeah. without that, there is no unity. Amen, amen. Well, let's go again. Uh, I needed someone to read uh, again. Another scripture that a sister text again is um, uh, was the uh, First Corinthians twelve verse twenty eight. Again, we have another witness. We have another witness. So, can someone read First Corinthians twelve verse twenty eight? It's Corinthians twelve verse twenty eight. Bible reads, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, government, diversity of tongues. Okay, amen. And so we see these gifts, these are spiritual gifts that we have to consider and also, when you think about visions and dreams, these are also connected, also a spiritual gifts that have been given to God's people at the end of time. And so, let's consider um, these gifts and how God is using those gifts in his church, in his end time church, in his remnant church, for his people who are living at the end of time. Um, let's go to, um, I'm going down the lesson and... We just looked at Ephesians 4, 11, 13, and 1 Corinthians 12. And I'm, I'm read a little statement right below that. Um, it says, The scriptures of truth were the foundation upon which the Adventist pioneer faith was built. Um, the verses quoted above introduce one of the earliest statements on the subject of spiritual gifts. Um, by a Sabbath-keeping Adventist leader in a review and herald on April 21, 1851. Now there's a, a statement that's being, being made by um, during the Advent movement um, there is a statement that was written by James White. Now James White uh, who was the Ellen White's husband uh, we'll see what he has to say, and um, let's see how this really uh, lets us know how important the gifts of prophecy is and the gifts that God gave to his people. It says, when, when the design of the gifts is clearly seen, then the importance of this subject will be under, understood. They were given for the perfecting of the church of Christ. When the apostolic church was pure and holy, having just learned the gospel from the great head of the church, and having been baptized with the Holy Ghost on the the day of Pentecost, the gifts of the Spirit were given to them for their edification and profit. And we have no scripture evidence that they were designed for a limited portion of the gospel age to be taken away from the church in a few years. 
No, we don't have no evidence that it was to be taken away. But the proof is abundant that they were designed to exist in the church as long as the saints in their mortal state needed the teaching of the Bible and the Holy Spirit. Review and Herald, April 21, 1851, and that was written by Elder James White. Amen. As we continue to this study this morning, um, uh, you know, it reads, it reads a little further down. Yes, it says, at least once before, in a pamphlet, A Word to the Little Flock, issued in May of 1847, James White had published his views on the subject of spiritual gifts. Here he prefaced the comments by quoting Joel's prophecy, which is also repeating in, in um, Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 20. So let's turn, let's read what, what, what was written in the book of Acts. That is also a second witness to the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 28 to 31. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 to 20. I'll get a reader for that, please. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 through 20. Acts 2, 17 to 20. Let me get there. Yes, let's go there. It says, And it shall come to pass in the last day, said God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servant and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapors of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. So we have a second witness. We have a second witness to the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 28 to 31. And upon two witnesses, a thing is established. So we're thankful that um, we can look in the scriptures and see how important it is. The prophets agree. The prophets will be Joel, Paul, in the book of Acts. So we see that uh, the prophets are agreeing that we will have these gifts in these last days. Um, let's go down. I'm going to go down to, there's a statement here that, um, yes, let's go down. And uh, we're speaking of, on the second page again. It says, um, here James White identified the prophecy of Joel, chapter 2, 28 to 31, with the appearance of visions and dreams in the last days. On the next page, he placed Mrs. White's first vision as it appeared the year before in, Edi in Editor Jacob's little journal, The Day Star. And so with We'll look at that vision, what he had shown. Um, it's in the book, Early Writings. Uh, let's see, Early Writings, and um, page 78. Early Writings, page 78. And um, in Early Writings, page 78, it reads, I recommend to you, Dear reader, the word of God as the rule of your faith and practice. By that word, we are to be judged. God has in that word promised to give visions to the, in the last days, not for a new rule of faith, but for the comfort of his people and to correct those who err from Bible truth. Thus God dealt with Peter when he has, was about to send him to preach to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. For those who may circulate this little work, which is um, 
early writings, I would say that it is designed for the sincere only and not for those who would rid ridicule the things of the Spirit of God. Again, that's in early writings, page 78. There's another scripture text I'd like us to go to. Um, let's turn to Isaiah 8, verse 20. Isaiah 8, verse 20. I'll get a reader for Isaiah 8.20. Uh, Isaiah, verse 8, chapter 8, verse 20. Hmm. It says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And if I may, actually, this is actually uh, tied to Revelations 12, 17, when it talks about the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God, that's the law, and the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy, that's the testimony spoken of in Isaiah 8, 20. Amen. Okay. Okay. Um... um I'm coming down in the, as we're going through the study, we'll, we'll see how important it is. It says harmony, there must be harmony between the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And that's very important. The pioneers recognize the prime position of the Holy Scriptures in the field of divine revelation. And they taught that spiritual gifts, including the gift of prophecy, were to be tested by the Bible, and not the Bible to be tested by spiritual gifts. Again, what is written, it says, in the pioneers recognize the prime position of the Holy Scriptures in the field of divine revelation, and they taught that spiritual gifts, including the gift of prophecy, were to be tested by the Bible and not the Bible by, the spirit, by its spiritual gifts. But since the gift of prophecy was bestowed by the same Holy Spirit who inspired the Bible writers, there could be only unity and harmony, never disagreement between the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy. As we continue, we see James White also made another statement um, uh, stated right below. It says, James White stated in his early articles deal, uh, dealing with the appearance of the prophetic gift. The Bible is a perfect and complete revelation. It is, a, it is our only rule of faith and practice. But this is no reason why God may not show the past, present, and future fulfillment of his word in these last days by dreams and visions according to Peter's testimony in Acts 2, 17 to 20. True visions are given to lead us to God and his written word. But those that are given for a new rule of faith, and practice separate from the Bible, cannot be from God, and should be rejected. And this is in, uh, he wrote this in A Word to the Little Flock, page 13. Um, I'll make one other, another statement, then we'll turn over. Um, both James and Ellen White recognize that the Bible is the great rule of faith and duty, and but that the spirit of prophecy was employed by God in our day to comfort his people, to correct those who erred from Bible truth. 
the early leaders, including um, the Whites, Joseph Bates, J. H. Wagoner, M. E. Cornell, and others, who were gathered in a conference at Battle Creek, Michigan in December of 1855, expressed their convictions in a joint statement as follows. Nor do we, or as some contend, exalt these gifts or their manifestations above the Bible. On the contrary, we test them by the Bible, making it the great rule of judgment in all things, so that whatever is not in accordance with it, it's in its spirit and in its teachings, we unhesitatingly reject. But as we cannot believe that a fountain sends forth at the same place sweet water and bitter, or that an evil tree brings forth good fruit, so we cannot believe that that is of the enemy which tends to unite the hearts of the saints, to lead to meekness and humility and holy living, and incites to, uh, incites to deep heart searching before God and a confession of our wrongs. As he was written in Review and Herald, December 4th, 1855. Now we, we know that um, also that Captain Bates you know, there, he was also with, with Ellen White um, doing when she was um, having visions. Um, and one, one thing that uh, was brought out about Elder James Bates is that, jo Joseph Bates, I should say, he was a retired sea captain and prominent among the Adventist pioneers. He was prejudiced against dreams and visions, and at first was not inclined to accept Ellen Goldwhite's visions as of divine origin. Yet he did not, yet he did not um, assign to them an evil source. He was honest in his position, struggling with doubt. His caution and reticence represented a wholesome skepticism typical of honest persons who did not understand Mrs. White's work. But the evidence needed to convince Captain Bates was not long in coming. In a meeting that was held in Topsham, Maine in 1846, at which both Captain Bates and, and Mrs. White were present, Mrs. White was given a vision. And while in vision, she began to talk about this starry heavens and certain heavenly bodies, which Captain Bates readily recognized. From former conversations, he realized that Mrs. White had no knowledge of, of astronomy. Her description of what she saw fully convinced Elder Bates that the visions were completely outside of her knowledge and control. In relating his transition from doubt to faith. In the Revelations, Joseph Bates wrote in April 1847, he says, it is now about two years since I first saw the author, Ellen Harmon, and heard her relate the substance of her visions as she has once published them in Portland, April 8, 1846. Although I could see nothing in them that indicated that, that mitigated against the word, yet I felt alarmed and tried exceedingly and for a long time unwilling to believe that it was anything more than what was produced by a protracted, debilitated state of, his, of her body. I, therefore, sought opportunities in presence of others, when her mind seemed free from excitement, out of meeting, to question and cross-question her and her friends, which accompanied her, especially her elder sister, to get, if possible, at the truth. During this, the number of visits she has made to New Bedford and Fairhaven, 
while at our meetings, I have seen her in vision a number of times and also in Topsham, Maine. Those who were present doing some of these exciting scenes know well with what interest and intensity. I listen to every word and watch every move to detect deception or mesmeric influences. And I thank God for the opportunity I've had with others to witness these things. I can now confidently speak for myself. I believe the work is of God and is given to comfort and strengthen his scattered, torn, and peeled people. Remarks in, a, in Broadside, A Vision, Volume 1, 1847. Elder Bates's mute attitude and confidence reflected the thinking of many who at first doubted and then after studying the evidences accepted the work of Ellen White as from the Lord. Amen? Amen. As we continue, um, I just want to, uh, as we go through, through this study, we're seeing how important it is that um, we see dreams, visions, and we have, you know, one, we have a couple more that, that I want to share um, a thought from, and one was from, uh, let's see. Um, a thought from from Uriah Smith. Now, if this is one of the reformers, also he was also uh, al um, along that time where the Advent reform was going on, and Uriah Smith uh, makes some statements here, and um, you know, when we claim to stand on the Bible, the Bible alone. We bind ourselves to receive inequivocally and fully all that the Bible teaches. This being a self-evident proposition, we pass on to inquire what the Bible teaches concerning the outpouring of the Spirit in its operations, the gift of prophecy and visions. It is the prerogative of this dispensation over all others to rejoice in the outpouring of the Spirit it is called emphatically a dispensation in which we have the ministration of the Spirit. The prophecy which gleamed like a star of hope before the ancient prophets was this. And this, he's speaking again of Joel. And this, he says, and it shall come to pass in these last days, said God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. The prophecy, this prophecy applies to this dispensation and its fulfill, fulfillment commenced, but only commenced on that day of Pentecost. And what follows the outpouring of the Spirit? Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. The very next announcement, after the fact that the Spirit was to be given, is that the gift of prophecy will be exercised. Not just so sure as one part of the prophecy is fulfilled, God grants his Spirit to his people just as, sure, the other parts will be fulfilled and the prophesying dreams and visions will be manifested in their midst, for they are connected together, one and inseparable. And we consider that, you know, that the prophecy of Joel is also being fulfilled, will be fulfilled again in our day. These gifts will be given, and uh, the promise is that he will part his spirit. Again, your sons, your daughters shall see dreams and visions. Your old men shall have visions. These gifts are still being poured out upon God's church at the end of time. Um, let's see. I would also like to just share one other statement. How much time do we have? Oh, yeah, we're zero? Okay, okay. Well, um, I'll just like to, okay, just close it up. Um, it's been so much, it's so much to share. 
And um, I would just like to say, you know, as we consider the writings of Ellen White and the Bible, and her visions were given for the church, um, and she has, you know, written so many books. When you think about Steps to Christ, The Sanctified Life, The Great Controversy, one of the, one of the great, you know, think of a great uh, book that everyone should have a copy of, and everyone should be reading The Great Controversy, and her book, The Desire of Ages. Again, the best book ever written on the life of Christ. You know, we have so many of her writings, Desire of Ages, um, Pitch Us on Prophets, Prophets and Kings, Acts of the Apostle, Gospel Workers, um, The Story of Redemption. It's much that we have been given, Adventist Home, Council on Diet and Food and the Ministry of Healing, which is the health message, which is the right hand of the gospel. And again, education, Ministry of Healing. We have so much. We have been given so much for our church. And so, um, as we consider the writings of Ella White, and she is a prophet, you know, um, um, there's a book, uh, we'll just share this one last thought. In her writings, Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11, 12, and 13, she was sown towers that came down. And she wrote this 100 years before it came to pass. But it is, it is in Testimonies, Volume 9, 11. 9-11, September, remember 9-11, 2001? Well, that vision was given to Ellen White of what happened there on September 11, 2001. It says, when a, when a prophet's, uh, a word of a prophet and the vision of a prophet has become fulfilled, we know we have truly, God has given us a prophet for these end times, and her writings are uh, for us and for the Advent Church to prepare a people for his second coming and also to stand in the day of, of trouble. Let us send him with a word of prayer. O most kind, beloved Heavenly Father, we are thankful, Lord, for the many gifts that you have given and poured upon your church, this remnant church, this Advent church, that are looking forward to the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we have been given so many of Ellen White's writings, and we see that her writings are, are being attacked, but we know, Lord, that she is a true prophet and that you have raised us up and that you've given her to your remnant church for such a time as this. So, Lord, we ask that you would continue to be uh, with your church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, and the remnant. Uh, here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy. And Lord, we are thankful for these many gifts that you have bestowed upon your church. And we pray that you will be with each one that has heard this message today and that um, many uh, would be drawn back to turn back to read and to believe in the writings of the prophets. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.